Well, hello everyone, and welcome to my opinion as to the five most important trends in English language teaching as of this moment, uh, July 2012. Uh, that's me there, Adam Simpson, uh, and that's the address of my blog. Please uh, drop by sometime and um, see what I have to say. <laughs> Probably won't like it, but please drop by anyway. Okay, so um, these are just my thoughts about what's going on in our profession. Please disagree with me as violently as you can, okay? But anyway, let's take a look. Okay, so first up, what have we got? Okay, this um, this might seem obvious, and I, I wasn't going to include this because I thought, oh, you know, dogma ELT, everybody knows about it, everybody's aware of what it is, you know, is it really a current trend, or is it, you know, something that's been going on for 10 years? And the truth of the matter is, um, Many of us do know about this, and we know all about it, and um, what it stands for, and the main protagonists, Scott Thornbury, Luke Meddings among them. But um, a lot of people don't. I mean, there are a lot of people out there who are just uh, teaching by numbers. You know, they've got, you know, they work wherever they work, has given them a course book. They just said, right, go in, start at this page, and continue as, you know, to wherever you get to. And that's, you know, that constitutes their teaching. And, you know, who am I to tell, tell you that you're wrong doing that? You fulfilling your employer's requirements. So um, I thought, you know, I would include this because it is important. And um, the list of uh, names I've included there, obviously there's the two people who wrote the uh, wonderful Teaching Unplugged. But I think the important uh, factor here is the ELT bloggers who are now discussing Dogma ELT in great detail. And that for me is why this is an important trend at the moment. People are not satisfied with just going in with a course book and saying, right, open page one, look at the picture, what do you see? Now two people work together and write a list, of yada, 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 you know? People are going in, they're saying, okay, how am I teaching? How is this actually benefiting the language learners in front of me? And um, what opportunities am I missing? And it's just lots of reflection on teaching. And this is really the key to the whole dogma philosophy. For me, it's a philosophy which you can apply to any methodology you want. It's not a methodology in itself. It's just a way of viewing your teaching and taking the opportunities to better um, facilitate learning with your learners. So for me, number one, Dogma ELT. Okay, there's going to be loads of links uh, on my blog for this, for those who are interested in learning more. Okay, so on to number two. Number two, demand high ELT. Uh, this is something I've become aware of um, in the last year, really. And um, the two leading names in this, really the guys that came up with this, are the well-known authors, Adrian Underhill and Jim Scrivener. And um, the whole notion of demand high ELT is um, um, aim higher, really. You know, do more. Don't give... Um, praise to your language learners when it's not worth, you know, when they haven't done anything particularly good. Um, demand higher standards from them, and um, what you'll probably end up with in doing so is um, better teaching from you and a higher level of uh, achievement from the learners. So just stop saying, oh, well done, you know, you've strung two words together. Actually demand more from them. Um, they've set up is it a website or a blog? I think it's a blog, anyway. And I'll, I'll give a link below to where you can find this. It's an interesting reading, and I think this is an important development if we're starting to take ourselves seriously as a profession. Okay, on to number three. S up. <laughs> okay, for those who are not aware, this is uh, English for specific academic purposes. And um, I've included this because it, um, it largely affects me, but um, it's also an indication of the way that um, publishing is going. So um, the main players in this are the major publishers. That might be quite sort of general sort of thing for me to say, but it is. Um, so what is ESAP? Well, it's, it's um, this may or may not be... Um, a reaction to the whole Dogma ELT movement. I suspect in part it is. And it's um, 
sort of moving beyond the headway generation of course books and saying, right, what does this small, very specific group of language learners actually need in terms of English? And how can we prepare a book that will cater exactly to those needs? And in the last um, three, four years, um, great strides have been made in, in providing course books that are specific and well-written and genuinely catering to the need of the few as well as they possibly can. And um, one series that I really like is the, um, the Garnet books. Um, I've written a review recently for one of them on the uh, TEFLnet um, website. I'll provide a link to that. Um, English for Psychology. And it's not even English for Psychology, it's English for the Academic Study of Psychology. That's how specific it is. And in doing so, they're recognizing that, you know, they have a small market for this, but they'll have a dedicated market because they're doing the job really well. So Garnet's one publisher that I like. I like the way they're going about what they're doing. And OUP, CUP are catching up. They've done some good academic work. But it's just nice to say that, you know, I mean, thinking back to my early career, it's like, okay, let's change the course, but this year, what are we going to do? Well, let's start them off with headway. And it's like, well, you know, I'm in an academic environment. Headway is just not, you know, it's not doing it for me, it's not doing it for the students. So this is a recognition that um, you've got to give the language learners what they need is, is finally sort of being sort of realized. And, you know, it's, I, I'd like to think this is um, a direct result of the dogma movement, but <laughs> maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just the publishers looking for new ways to make money. Whichever, it's still a positive thing, I think. Okay then, on to number four. Mm, social media, obvious, obvious, obvious. Okay, to a large extent it is obvious because it's, um, you know, it's opening up new channels for people learning English to sort of practice with speakers to obtain sort of uh, uh, real language samples constantly and be able to practice and use what they know and what they're trying to develop. So um, Facebook, Twitter and stuff, for the language learners, obviously it's providing new channels of, uh, well, new channels. <laughs> but um, something that we may not have considered before is the effect that it's having on the publishers. And believe me, it is. Okay, there's, um, while I was sort of thinking about this uh, video, I started looking around on YouTube for clips and um, there's an interesting one, sort of trends in ELT marketing, it's called, and it's just basically a, big, a get together of publishers and they talk about what's affecting them and um, they've identified social media because language learners are talking about the courses they've taken they're talking about the books they've used and if they don't like it they're bitching about it and words getting out so social media is being utilized by um, the, the customers and the publishers are thinking oh hang on a minute you know you know they they going to tell people if our books are rubbish or if the courses we're running aren't very good. So um, in this way, social media is now having um, quite a big impact and um, the publishers are realizing this. I think that's a good thing. Okay, and on to number five. One word, China. Who's this going to affect? Everyone. Okay, so... Um, the publishers have identified this as the next big market. I mean, they've kind of sort of chewed up and spat out, for want of a better phrase, um, Korea and Japan. And now they're looking at um, China. And this is sort of a mid, mid to long term kind of thing. You know, they're saying, well, OK, the situation in China now, this huge population, they don't yet have a huge disposable income and they're not traveling abroad to study. But given another 10 or 15 years, uh, they probably will be, and you're going to be inundated with um, the Chinese going abroad, going to Europe and America to study English, and then to go on and complete their academic studies. So they, there's going to be a huge market, and it's going to be a lot of money. Okay, so um, of course, I mean there, you know, tens of thousands of people are teaching English in China already, and um, the conditions are varying. 
but um, the situation is going to expand and things are going to change so this is this is the trend I mean it, it, in the future this may be where a lot of people aim to go and a lot of people end up teaching in China if they want to go abroad because it's going to be a very big very expanding market okay so that's my five what I'd like you to do wherever you're watching this be it on YouTube or on my blog um, come up with number six tell me what you think the current trend is what on earth have I missed the obvious the not so obvious okay so just leave your ideas I'd like to sort of compile them and add them to my blog post on this okay last but not least thank you very much for listening that's me okay <laughs> alright that's me in action and um, I'm gonna end this now before it gets any worse okay thanks for listening bye